Okay, so um, my talk is going to be a lot less scientific than the two you've seen already. Um, I don't have any gross pictures. I don't have any of the cool protein <laughs> videos coming together. Um, I kind of want to talk more about, you know, for those of you who don't know anything about medicine or, you know, just in particular, hopefully you've learned a lot tonight, but um, I want to talk to you more, a little bit on a simpler level, you know, how to find and uh, participate in a clinical trial really is a lot about protocol, um, where to go, and that kind of thing. So we're going to get into kind of some logistics about that. Most of the trials that we run here and kind of the population I'm talking about are the people that have gone through Gleevec for the most part, um, maybe failed Sutin, maybe failed Regorafenib. You start to get kind of down the line in your head, we want you to start thinking about a clinical trial, and that's where centers like ours will come into play. It's not 100% true. We do run clinical trials for earlier, you know, people who are just starting on Gleevec and that kind of thing. But this would typically be for people who start to fail treatments down the road. It's not working. There we go. Um, so, again, rare disease. Uh, I, my comparator here was the breast cancer population. Lots and lots of cases. So just is, is relatively rare in the cancer world. Um, if you're going to think about where to go to, to, you know, express interest in participating in a clinical trial, the sites around the country that, that we work most often with are um, Dana-Farber in Boston, Fox Chase is in Philadelphia, MD Anderson is obviously a huge cancer center, and then Memorial Sloan Kettering in New York. There are obviously other sites around the country that are, that are doing just trials, but these are kind of the biggies. You notice and for the most part, we're the only one on the West Coast. Stanford does clinical trials. You know, there are others, but if you're talking about, again, big centers with specialty sites, these are going to be the ones that you're looking for. Um, and that's okay. We do this every day. And I put this slide here because I wanted to show people where people come from to see us. Um, it's not just an Oregon thing. Um, I'd say 90% of the people that we treat live outside of the state of Oregon. We talk about a rare disease, and then you're talking about a clinical trial population. Um, we really do have people from all over the country. Um, we had a patient last year from Nigeria, okay, and he came once a month for about two years, something like that. He came once a month. I will mention that most of the time our trials, um, we try really hard to negotiate budgets so that we can pay for travel for people to come. So don't assume that just because we live on the west, you know, that we're on the west coast that it would be impossible for you to get here. Um, we will be happy to talk to you about how we can help you pay for that. Um, but before we get into a clinical trial, let's talk a little, a little bit about what are the phases of research. Um, the first phase, phase one, clinical trials are literally um, the first time in humans. So they've often done a lot of research in the lab. They've done research with animals, mice, dogs, primates, um, but has never been given to a human for the most part. Um, so if you're entering a phase one trial, the goal of that trial, of course we hope it works and it helps you, but literally the goal of a phase one clinical trial is to find out what dose we should be giving and is this safe to give. And so because of that, it goes very slowly. <laughs> We're not going to just throw a new drug to humans and give it to 100 people and see what happens. Um, it literally goes three people at a time, and then we wait a month. And then it goes three people again, and we wait a month. And so for Dr. Heinrich and I, who have ants in our pants, it is very slow going. Um, and so we have a couple trials that I'll talk about at the end here um, that are phase one. And so you may call me and say, I want to be on this clinical trial, and I'm going to say, okay, we're going to put you on a list because it's a phase one, and we are just, it's like they have to hold us back because we want to get going, but we have to just wait and make sure that we get to the right dose. So phase one, small, small numbers of people looking for the right dose and checking safety. Um, phase two, so now we know, okay, we've settled on our dose. Now we want to know what happens with that dose. We'll continue to follow side effects and safety, but we want to know, does it work? Does it work for GIST? Does it work for the other cancers that maybe it touched in the phase one study? Um, and then phase three, larger groups of people. Um, and we'll take, you know, the steady medication versus what is already approved, and we'll compare them head to head. So we think this is the best treatment that we have, but does this new thing work better? 
And then phase four studies, we don't really do here. Those would be sort of after the fact. The FDA generally approves the drug already, but they might continue to follow data just to see if when you give it to tens of thousands of patients, does it develop some sort of side effect that we did, just didn't see in the smaller numbers. Okay, questions, by the way, anyone stop, ask, please. So what do you do before you uh, need a clinical trial? Um, basics, just for anybody who's, who's venturing down this road of what, what do I do now that I have this diagnosis? Check with your insurance. Um, it's gotten better, and actually just this week I got an update, the state of Oregon has now jumped on board. Federally, um, the Affordable Care Act now uh, allows patients to participate in a clinical trial without any sort of discrimination, and Oregon now follows that guide. Um, there was an issue with some of our Medicaid, state Medicaid plans, but that's now been fixed. So when you're asking about insurance, people, you know, you're looking around at your job or trying to figure out what Medicare supplement to get, make sure you ask the question. Um, you know, is it going to be okay for me to participate in the clinical trial? Um, clinical trials do not pay for everything. Some people come to me and just assume that they're going to, you know, hand, I'm going to hand me their bills and we're going to pay all of it. That's not true. 95% of what happens still goes to your insurance company. Um, most of the time, the drugs are what's provided, and then maybe there'll be some study parts, things on the side that are paid for by the clinical trial. So it's really important to have supplemental insurance. Um, I talked about the exceptions. Here we are with the mutation again. Um, as we've talked about, the most common um, pop, piece of the pie on my slide here is the kit mutations, um, PDGF being sort of the second lump, and then there's the wild type. Um, when you call me, and my number and all that is at the end here, if you're a patient who calls me, this is going to be one of my first questions, kind of when were you diagnosed, and then what is your mutation? And the reason, as Dr. Heinrich alluded to, is um, often we will have clinical trials literally that will say, you know, the only patients that are eligible for this trial must have hit exon 11. Those are the only people that we're going to try this drug on because we've looked at it in a lab and that appears to be the group that it works for. And so there'd be sort of no point in giving it to a wild type patient. Or vice versa, we had a study just a year or so or two years ago where it was only for wild type patients. So when you call, it's really, really important to know that mutation. Currently, our studies are for all comers. So we don't have a study in many ways that is only for a certain disease. So it can work both ways. I still need to know your mutation if you call me, and we encourage you, obviously, we've talked about a lot tonight, um, to know your own mutations. But it helps us kind of put you into a bucket of what we might offer and what clinical trials might be available for you. Um, we talked a little bit about wild type. Uh, tissue mutation testing sort of as soon as possible, as soon as they take anything out. You don't need it anymore. Get it tested for mutation with your first surgery or your first biopsy. Um, at a minimum, if you start on Gleevec and then you fail Gleevec, we'd encourage you at that point to start to look at what your mutation testing would be. And then people always say, how do I get that done? What do I do? I send a lot of emails to Dr. Corliss and that say, you know, I've got a patient calling me from Tennessee and they don't know how to get their mutation testing. And we will connect you with People who do that, I will work with your local doctor's office. Uh, we do this all the time. People send tissue to us to be tested. We can help you figure out somewhere closer that might do tissue testing and mutation testing. Um, but we do a lot of it here, and we get things sent from all over the country. Um, did I go backwards? No. Nope. Um, then the other thing I want you to do at home before you even get too far into this, you're diagnosed, you're going to figure out your mutation, and then the better records you can keep, the better it will help people down the road. Um, when you call me again, I'm going to ask, what's your date of diagnosis? Please, please, please keep a copy of all your pathology reports. So they might just do one, but if you're someone who fails some drugs down the road, they might go back and do additional biopsies. Maybe you have two surgeries and they're going to be at two different pathology reports. Hang on to all of those and keep track of when did you have your surgery, where was it, and then the pathology report. Um, we will often go back and get that tissue and have to send that in. So the more details you can keep, keep a little gist file for yourself. It's, um, it's a good idea. And then 
the treatments you've been on and what date. So I took Gleevec from August 2010 to, you know, September of 2012, and I stopped it because it stopped working. And then they started me on Sutin, and I stopped it because my blood pressure was too high. Kind of keep a running tally of what you've been on and when. We will ask you those questions because those are the things we get asked for clinical trials. They want to know, this study is for people who have failed Gleevec and Sutin. And so I have to know, when were you on those? How long ago? All those kind of questions. So the more detail you can keep track of, it will help you down the road. Sounds like a big job, but it's a good job for spouses. A lot of times family members are good at kind of these details. Um, how do you find a clinical trial? Um, there are two websites that we use and I recommend to families, molecularmass.com and clinicaltrials.gov. I'm not going to go into them here, just in the nature of the fact that we're running a little bit later this evening. But um, please feel, feel free to fiddle around a little bit with these websites. They're really, really user friendly. You go into both of them and it just literally says, enter the type of cancer that you have. And you type in, you know, gastrointestinal stromal tumor or GIST. And it will pull them up for you and then it will say, um, here are a list of the open clinical trials. If you can click on where are those trials open, who's running them, and it will give you a list of the sites around the country that have the trial open. Many of them are filtered. Um, the molecular mass site filters by mutation. So you, if you know your mutation, you can click your mutation, and it will tell you what studies would be open for your mutation. It's really, really user-friendly. And then at the last part, it will link you to whatever site is open and the name of the person at that site who is running that trial or who is a contact for that trial. So it will help you get immediately to the whatever center you'd be, you know, you'd be interested in. And then just quickly, um, what do we have coming here um, or currently have open here? Our first trial, BLU-285, is a phase one trial using a kit inhibitor that literally when we gave it to our first patient, as I mentioned, no one in the world had ever taken it. So we put the first three people in the world on this drug um, and kind of crossed our fingers. Um, it's an oral medicine taken daily. Uh, this is one that that's, we're having a hard time um, getting enough slots because we have so many people we want to give this to. It appears to be more active for the PDGFRA group. Um, so those are kind of the patients that um, we are looking for at this point, but it's not been at all um, finalized that it is more or less effective with other mutations. It just appears early on that maybe the PDGFRA D842B group um, is responding a little better to this. So especially people with that mutation, um, this would be something that we would recommend. Again, phase one, so there's going to be lists around the country of people trying to jockey for spots. Um, but we do have a study open here in OHSU. Once the study finds the dose, the trial will open up a little bit more, so there will be more opportunities for people to go on this study. So don't give up on this one early if you don't get a spot, you know, somewhere because it's kind of limited numbers. Um, the other study we run, are running that's going to be literally next week, we're getting our sort of our initiation visit underway, is um, a, a drug called KTN, I can't, I can't remember the numbers, I should have written them down, it doesn't matter, but this one is an IV drug. It works very um, uh, differently from the pictures we saw up here, and I'll have to have Dr. Heinrich make you some models and some pictures for how this one works, but it's... Um, it's it's an antibody that basically blocks KET activation, and so um, he kind of describes it as it's very similar to a drug called Herceptin that's being used for breast cancer, for those of you who maybe have heard of that. Just a little different modeling. Um, again, it's an IV medication, so it would be something we give it every three weeks. You'd be at OHSU every three weeks for an IV treatment. Um, so very different from our traditional treatments for just in that, you know, most of them are oral drugs that you take every day. So this one is literally opening hot off the press next week, next Monday we have our vi uh, visit. So this would be open, and this is open for all mutations. Um, and then another one coming probably next summer, late summer, early fall is uh, SARC-029, um, oral drugs, two combo drugs called Tremetinib and Pazopinib. Um, work very differently, um, and so they're going to be working in simultaneously. So you'd take two pills on this one, two different pills. Um, 
all comers, if I remember, mutation-wise. I think so. Third line, maybe. Uh, and that one is only for people who have, uh, you have to have failed Gleevec, Sutin, and Regorafinib. Anything beyond those three, you would not be eligible for this last trial. Okay, so it's kind of a little bit earlier in, in the metastatic setting for patients. But that one's coming as well, again, in the summer, early fall. Um, and then the last slide, I just here have my contact info. And feel free to share this. Um, I get calls from people, husbands, daughters, wives around the country all the time. And I'm happy to help you get in to see Dr. Heinrich um, in second opinion. If you're not already seeing him, I can help you navigate how to get in for a clinical trial. I can help you figure out if you're eligible for a clinical trial. Um, so I'm happy to field questions and direct you to the right way or get you to Dr. Corliss's lab for mutation testing, whatever you might need. Okay? So thank you.